Chapter 9 Traders, Kings and Pilgrims How to find out about trade and traders? You read about the northern black polished wares in Chapter 8. These fine pottery, especially bowls and plates, were found from several archaeological sites throughout the subcontinent. How do you think it reaches these places? Traders may have carried them from the place where they were met to sell them at other places. South India was famous for good spices, especially pepper and precious stones. Pepper was particularly valued in the Roman Empire so much so that it was known as black gold. So traders carried many of these goods to Rome in ships across the city and by land in caravans. There must have been quite a lot of trade as many Roman gold coins have been found in South India. Traders explored several sea routes, some of them followed the coasts. There were other across the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal where sailors took advantage of the monsoon winds to cross the seas more quickly so if they wanted to reach the western coast of the subcontinent from East Africa or Arabia, they chose to sail with the southwest monsoon and the sturdy ships had to be built for these long journeys. New Kingdoms Along the Coasts The southern half of the subcontinent is marked by a long coastline and with hills, plateaus and river valleys. Amongst the river valleys, that of the Kaveri is the most fertile chief and kings who controlled the river valleys and the coasts became rich and powerful. Sangam poems mention the Muvendar. This is a Tamil word meaning three chiefs used for the heads of three ruling families the Cholas, Cheras and Pandyas, who became powerful in South India around 2300 years ago. Each of the three chiefs had two centers of power, one in land and one on the coast. Of these six cities, two were very important, Puar or Kaveri Pattinam, the port of the Cholas and the Madurai, the capital of the Pandyas. The chiefs did not collect regular taxes, instead they demanded and received gifts from the people. They also went on military expeditions and collected tribute from neighboring areas. They kept some of the wealth and distributed the rest amongst their supporters including members of their family, soldiers and poets. Many poets whose compositions are found in the Sangam collection composed poem in praise of chiefs who often rewarded them with precious stones, gold, horses, elephants, chariots and fine cloths. Around 200 years later, a dynasty known as the Satvahanas became powerful in western India. The most important rulers of Satvahanas was Gautami Putra Sri Satkarni. We know about him from an inscription composed on behalf of his mother, Gautami Balasri. He and other Satvahana rulers were known as Lord of the Dakshinpath, literally the route leading to the south which was also used as a name for the entire southern region. He sent his army to the eastern, western and southern posts. The Story of the Silk Group The rich glossy colors of silk as well as its smoothy texture make it a highly valued fabric in most societies. Making silk a complicated process, raw silk has to be extracted from the cocoons of silk worms, spun into thread and then woven into cloths. Techniques of making silk were first invented in China about 7000 years ago. While the methods remain a closely guarded secret for thousands of years, some people from China who went to distant land on foot, horseback and on camels carried silk with them. The paths they followed came to be known as the Silk Route. Sometimes Chinese rulers sent gifts of silk to rulers in Iran and West Asia and from there the knowledge of silk spreads further west. About 2000 years ago, wearing silk became the fashion amongst rulers and rich people in Rome. It was very expensive as it had to be brought all the way from China along dangerous routes through mountains and deserts. People living along the routes often demanded payments for allowing traders to pass through. Look at map 6 which shows that the Silk Route and its branches, some kings tried to control large portion of the routes. This was because they could benefit from taxes, tributes and gifts that were brought by traders traveling along the route. In return, they often protected the traders who passed through their kingdoms from attacks by robbers. The best known of the rulers who controlled the Silk Route were the Kusanas, 
who ruled over Central Asia and Northwest India around 2000 years ago. Their two major centers of power were Peshawar and Mathura. Takshila was also included in their kingdom during their rule. A branch of the Silk Route extended from Central Asia down to the seaports of at the mouth of the river Indus, from where silk was shipped westward to the Roman Empire. The Kusanas were amongst the earliest rulers of the subcontinent to issue boat coins. These were used by traders along the Silk Route. The spirit of Buddhism. The most famous Kusana ruler was Kanishka, who ruled around 1900 years ago. He organized at Buddhist Council, where scholars met and discussed important matters. Aswabhosh, a poet who composed a biography of the Buddha Charit, lived in his court. Ashwabhus and other Buddhist scholars now began writing in Sanskrit a new form of Buddhism known as Mahayan Buddhism now developed. This had two distinct features. Earlier, the Buddha's presence was shown in sculpture by using certain signs. For instance, his attainment of enlightenment was shown by sculptures of the people tree. Now, statues of the Buddha were made. Many of these were made in Mathura, while others were made in Takshila. The second change was a belief in Bodhisattvas. These were supposed to be persons who had attained enlightenment. Once they attained enlightenment, they could live in complete isolation and meditate in peace. However, instead of doing that, they remained in the world to teach and help other people. The worship of Bodhisattvas became very popular and spread throughout Central Asia, China, and later to Korea and Japan. Buddhism also spread to Western and Southern India, where dozens of caves were hollowed out of hills for monks to live in. Some of these caves were made on the orders of kings and queens, others by merchants and farmers. These were often located near passes through the Western Ghats Road, connecting prosperous ports on the coasts with cities in the Deccan ran through these passes. Traders probably halted in these cave monasteries during their travels. Buddhism also spread southeastward to Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, and other parts of Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. The older form of Buddhism known as Theravada Buddhism was more popular in these areas. The Quest of the Pilgrims As traders journeyed to distant lands in caravans and ships, pilgrims often traveled with them. Pilgrims are men and women who undertake journeys to holy places in order to offer worship. The best known of these are the Chinese Buddhist pilgrims. Fazian, who came to the subcontinent about 1600 years ago, Zhuan Zhang, who came around 1400 years ago, and Ai King, who came around 50 years after Zhuan Zhang. They came to visit places associated with the life of the Buddha as well as famous monasteries. Each of these pilgrims left an account of his journey, they wrote of the dangers they encountered on their travels which often took years of the countries and the monasteries that they visited and the books they carried back with them. How Faz Yang returned to China Faz Yang began his journey back home from Bengal. He boarded a ship belonging to some merchants. They had barely traveled for two days when they were caught in a storm. The merchants began throwing their merchandise overboard so as to lighten the load and save the ship from sinking. Faz Yang threw away his Miyagra personal belongings but clung to his books and the statues of the Buddha that he had collected. Finally, the storm subsided after 30 days. This is how he describes the sea. The sea itself is boundless in extent. It is impossible to know east or west except by absorbing the sun, moon or stars in their motions. If it is dark rainy weather, the only plan is to steer by the wind. It took him more than 90 days to reach Java, where he halted for 5 months before boarding another merchant ship that took him to China. Zhuang Zhang, who took the land route back to China through the northwest and central Asia, carried back with him statues of the Buddha made of gold, silver, and sandalwood and over 600 manuscripts loaded on the backs of 20 horses over 50 manuscripts were lost when the boat on which he was crossing the indus 
capsized. He spent the rest of his life translating the remaining work scripts from Sanskrit into Chinese. Nalanda, a unique center of Buddhist learning. Zhuang Zheng and other pilgrims spent time studying in Nalanda, Bihar, the most famous Buddhist monastery of the period. This is how he describes it. The teachers are men of the highest ability and talent. They follow the teachings of the Buddha in all sincerity. The rules of the monastery. The rules of the monastery are strict and everyone has to follow them. Discussions are held throughout the day and the old and the young men mutually help one another. Learned men from different cities come here to settle their doubts. The gatekeeper asks new entrant difficult questions. They are allowed to enter only after they have been able to answer these. 7 or 8 out of every 10 are not able to answer. The beginning of Bhakti this was also the time when the worship of certain deities which became a central features of later Hinduism gained in importance. These deities included Shiva, Vishnu and goddesses such as Durga. These deities were worshipped through Bhakti, an idea that became very popular at this time. Bhakti is generally understood as a person's devotion to his or her chosen deity. Anybody whether rich or poor belonging to the so called high or low castes, men or women could follow the path of bhakti. The idea of bhakti is present in the Bhagavad Gita, a sacred book of the Hindus which is included in the Mahabharat. See chapter 11. In this Krishna, the god asks Arjuna, his devotee and friend, to abandon all dharmas and take refuge in him. As only he can set Arjuna free from every evil, this form of worship gradually spread to different parts of the country. Those who followed the system of bhakti emphasized devotion and individual worship of a god or goddess rather than the performance of elaborate sacrifices according to the system of belief. If a devotee worships the chosen deity with a pure heart, the deity will appear in the form in which he or she may desire so. The deity could be thought of as a human being lion, trees, or any other form. Once this idea gained acceptance, artists made beautiful images of these deities. Bhakti comes from the Sanskrit term bhaj meaning to divide or share. This suggests an intimate two-way relationship between the deity and the devotee. Bhakti is directed toward Bhagavat, which is often translated as God but also means one who possesses and shares bhag, literally good fortune or bliss, the devotee known as the bhakt or the bhagavata shares his or her chosen deities bhag. Because the deities were special, these images of the deity were often placed within special homes, places that we describe as temples. You will learn more about these temples in chapter 11. Bhakti inspired some of the best expressions in art, sculpture, poetry, and architecture. Hindu and The word Hindu, like the term India, is derived from the river Indus. It was used by Arabs and Iranians to refer to people who lived to the east of the river and to their cultural practices, including religious beliefs.